So we'd like to move on to adjuvant therapy. And Evan, so do you have a preference of adjuvant over neoadjuvant therapy and, and why? I absolutely have a preference. I definitely prefer neoadjuvant whenever possible. And the best level one evidence is in the neoadjuvant setting. There have been multiple adjuvant trials in the older days, uh, you know, multiple small adjuvant trials uh, with mixed results, but there were multiple issues with those trials, reporting issues, statistical flaws. Uh, there was a nice meta-analysis done that did seem to show a benefit to adjuvant therapy. But that being said and done, uh, that doesn't replace, you know, level one evidence from a randomized controlled trial. Now, in more recent years, there have been three attempts at large randomized controlled trials, uh, EOR EORTC, the Spanish trial, and an Italian trial. And unfortunately, none of them fully accrued. And we've seen some mixed results in those studies as well. But again, I think the key situation is whenever you can give it, you should try to give it in a neoadjuvant fashion. Of course, we do run into situations where the patient comes to our clinic and they've already had cystectomy, they've already had their surgical procedure. Then what do you do? Well, I think those situations uh, can be challenging, but I think it's most important to look at patient fitness, comorbidities, et cetera. And, and the reason is, <clears throat> is, is that one could extrapolate from the preoperative setting and say, has the biology really changed from the preoperative setting to the postoperative setting? Well, probably not, but there are a few things that are different that make me really prefer neoadjuvant chemotherapy. For instance, number one, the patient's going to tolerate it better when they're receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy than after they've undergone a major surgery and now they're going to receive adjuvant therapy. The other thing is, is that when you go, undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy, there's really a great marker, a biomarker of response, and that's, you alluded to that earlier with the PT0 rate. Um, you know, a complete response in the SWOG trial, the neoadjuvant SWOG trial, really conferred that the patients with a complete response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy had way better outcomes. We cure the vast majority of those patients. And so that's important information and, and data to learn from. And so again, uh, I would say that in any opportunity possible, I'd give it in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, if I don't have the choice or opportunity to intervene or make that decision, uh, then I really take it on a case-by-case -case basis with the right. patient. What's your time frame? What, what's the t optimal time that you'd like to administer your chemotherapy in these patients? Yeah. You know, I think that's not 100% clear in the adjuvant setting if you're, if when, when to administer chemotherapy. I do think sooner is better than later. Certainly, I wouldn't administer it within the first month after, after surgery. The patient has to be recovered from uh, the surgery, but there is some data that shows that if you want to administer chemotherapy that sooner is probably better, certainly within six, a six month time frame makes right. sense and that's what I would certainly target. I've seen some people say after two months don't bother with adjuvant therapy. Uh, Dean, is that what, what your institution? Yeah, we, we, we will generally think, we, we, we try to do it or try to start it within 12 weeks of the surgical procedure. And, and I typically try to target around six to eight weeks, but Evan makes a really good point. You know, the, this is major surgery. Mm -hmm. It's major surgery in an older patient population. And so trying to start chemotherapy quickly in somebody who's still recovering surgically um, is difficult. And if you start too early, you know, you, you may get the first couple doses in, right. but you can't get the entire course in. And, that, and that's what we all worry about. You know, this, this setting is crying for non-toxic therapy that's beneficial, uh, you know, for, for patients. Exactly. I, I think this is really an area where some of the newer immune therapy treatments uh, should move in because certainly we're seeing, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, we're seeing activity. But there are now trials that are being designed to look at some of the checkpoint inhibitors adjuvantly afterwards. And, and I think that that's, that's a really interesting area. I'll just bring up, there actually is an immunotherapy trial that's been performed in the adjuvant setting. Um, and that was basically targeting her 2 new. It was using an active cellular immunotherapy similar to Sapillus Health T in prostate cancer, but targeting her 2 new in bladder cancer. And it was also in this adjuvant setting for either patients who underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy and did not have a complete response. We know those patients have a worse prognosis. Or for patients who didn't undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And that basically allowed patients to receive this autologous cellular immunotherapy, again, three doses, similar to Sapulo cell T in prostate cancer. Um, and what we've seen early data from that is, is that immune biomarkers uh, have shown 
and very similar to prostate cancer in the fact that there's been a CD54 upregulation, which is a marker of an activated antigen presenting cell. Uh, there's been humoral responses with antibodies against the target, which is HER2 new in this instance. And so that data exists out there, but we have to wait for the mature survival data down the road. And certainly I think it's an interesting approach because if, if we see the analogy as to what happened with prostate cancer where you started seeing an antigen spread after a period of time where multiple antigens were now had either antibodies or cellular based immunity, immune effects. This I think could be a, certainly a very very powerful tool in taking care of patients and then of course identifying other antigens would be would be interesting from that standpoint to to generalize it more. As we know HER2 new is only expressed in about 20 to 30 percent of of bladder cancer specimens. There's some controversy as to whether it actually marks for a poor prognosis. I think probably the best study that looked at that in metastatic disease was Maha Hussein's study looking at a triplet chemotherapy regimen along with Herceptin. And, and she did note that, that there were higher levels of volume of disease in those patients who, uh, who actually were HER2 positive. So I think that this is a, a very interesting approach and certainly could be useful in the future. Yeah, one thing I'll bring up, and again, Dr. Bajoran is probably the best person to talk about this because I believe that was your, your study uh, as well. It is. So. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyhow, please correct me if I make any mistakes. But I believe in this trial targeting HER2 new with active cellular immunotherapy, um, they only needed one plus HER2 staining. And the thought is, is that, again, you're going to get an immune response and potentially have some bystander effect mm -hmm. with neighboring cells right. being uh, targeted as well down the road and antigen spread, as you mentioned earlier. Um, I believe if you use that one plus criteria, it was about 60 to 70 percent of the patients. Is that right? Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, and so I think, you know, for, for the audience, you know, that when we look at HER2, for example, we're looking at different aspects of the biology. Um, in Maha study, it was with trastuzumab. So it's really looking at, you know, HER2 as a functional, you know, uh, molecule. In this instance, it's looking at this molecule as a target for immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. So you're down into very low levels of expression, but all you need is a little bit of expression to be an antigen for immunotherapeutic response. And so that's exactly what was seen, um, was a high level of expression, but it's really not functional. Uh, and so uh, hopefully, we, you know, the, the um, approach will at least allow us to look at um, antigens uh, across the board. Uh, as you know, for example, the checkpoint blockade, you know, people are looking for neoantigens, et, et cetera, and I think that uh, you know, that's where we may be very shortly.